All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, sorry for the little delay. Um, unfortunately, uh, Nathan Fiala, he, he couldn't be here because of a family emergency. So we just have two presentations. Um, but we decided, since we have enough time, that we kind of add like 10 minutes to each presentation. Uh, I hope that's, that's fine with, with everyone. Um, so uh, Michael will start with uh, his presentation with the title, There is no place like home, theory and evidence on decentralization and politician preferences. The floor is yours. Turn off my phone. That's always, uh, I think, a good uh, good thing to do. Okay. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, Vivian Hoffman, uh, Pam Jaquila, uh, Ryan Shilley, and Matthew Goodkin Gold. And you know, both of the papers in today's session are going to be dealing with issues of of decentralization um, and local governments, and the. The standard way that development economists, or perhaps economists in general, think about decentralization is through Bardon-style uh, principal agent models, in which there's a central government, which is the principal, and there's a local government, which might be better informed, but has fundamentally different preferences. It may be, might be subject to you know, local capture, or maybe the local politicians are corrupt in some way. And um, you know, the reason why, the, why it, you might still give them some authority is because they've got better information. But really, they, they're, they're sort of the bad guys, and the central government is the good guy. And you know, I think the intellectual origin of these comes, uh, you know, a lot of this literature comes from a US perspective or a South Asian perspective. And you know, if you're thinking about um, Nehru at the center and some caste politician in the, in, in the local area, you know, that, or if you're thinking about Johnson and, and, uh, and a southern governor, you know, it's, it's pretty natural to think in those contexts. And I think there's a, lot of, you know, there's a lot to those models. But there's a fundamental asymmetry built in there. So what, what I'm going to suggest in um, a, a polar opposite way, which I obviously is going to be a little bit of a caricature as well, um, Instead, I'm going to follow a, a citizen candidate type approach, sort of a much more Buzzley Coat type approach, in which politicians can't commit, so their decisions are going to reflect their own preferences and, and incentives. And, but there'll be symmetry. There's no real difference in this model between the distribution of, of, of preferences for the, the local politicians and the national politicians. Um, now, what there's a one of the reasons why these uh, citizen candidate models have, have uh, got so much recognition is there's a really a wealth of empirical evidence now that candidate identity matters. Um, so, for example, female politicians do things that are, are more pro-women than, than uh, non-female politicians. Um, so, if you think about which identity groups are important, you know, one, one type of identity that's often very important and certainly important in the Kenyan context that, that, I, I, that this paper is, draws on is the home identity, the geographic identity or, or ethnic identity, which is often tightly linked. And there's a, a number of papers, uh, you know, big, actually a big tradition of papers looking at, at home preference to politicians allocate public goods to their home areas in, in Kenya alone. So I'm going, to, I'm going to try to model that, um, and you know, this is going to, a lot of this presentation will be on the theory, I should say, and acknowledge up front, you know, the theory was in a lot of ways motivated by our empirical findings rather than the other way around. So this is not a case, I can't claim we had a, a you know, we started out trying to test this theory. Um, so let me, let me outline the theory. So there, think of two, a, a very stylized country with two areas, I and J, so north and south, each which have, has two potential project sites. Um, so you have to build, the politicians are going to be building pieces of infrastructure. In our empirical case, it's going to be building, it's a piece of water infrastructure. And 
there's different values of building the infrastructure at different sites. You know, it could be that the, you know, a road is really needed one place but not another place, or that the uh, water, you know, you need to really clean up the water in one place. There are a lot of people who are using a water, one water site but not a, another water site. So there's some, there's some, these are drawn from some distribution, F, the value of the project if it's, if it's uh, done well. So politicians have, so they have to, um, they'll have to choose where to do the site, but they also have another choice. And the other choice is they can divert the funds to themselves. They can just, you know, allocate the bid for this corruptly and, and pocket the money. But there's some cost of, of that. They might get caught. They might have some disutility from it. Uh, so they only get one minus, they only get, they, they only get gamma if they do that. The project costs one. So think of gamma as depending on institutions, political culture, personal preference, the context, is it easy to get caught, is it difficult to get caught? You will know, we'll also think of that as stochastic. Okay. So there's three things that politicians can do. They can, if, if they, let's say that there's, uh, the constitutional structure allows them to spend anywhere. Let's say they're the president, they can spend anywhere. They, they, can, um, they can spend in their home area, they can spend outside their home area on the, on the other area, or they can just steal the money. Okay. So we can represent politicians' preferences. Um, we've got gamma to represent how they feel about corruption. We've also got alpha to say how much do they value their home area relative to other areas. So they put value one, we're normalizing one as the value on their home area, alpha is the value that they put on the other area. So alpha is between zero and one. If you're not at all home biased, if you're you know, Nieri or, or if we want to, you know, I, I don't really know what he was like, but, you know, based on the reputation, you know, we'd say he'd have alpha equals one, no, no home bias at all. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. So in this setup, you can think about a constitution. I'm going to go over this you know, pretty quickly given the length of the, the presentation. But, and I won't give the technical, uh, fully technical just uh, definitions here, but we think about the full space of possible constitutions. And we're gonna focus, there are a bunch of constitutions that are sort of obviously crazy and I won't spend much time about the, on them, but in the paper we go through all the, all the possible constitutions in this very stylized definition of a constitution. So a constitution divides the project sites into, it partitions the project sites. So, you know, you could put them all in one area, and you could just have a president who decides, chooses anywhere, or you could say, well, we're partitioning this, so there's sort of a, you know, there's the north and there's the south, and the, the north, there's a northern state and a southern state, and the northern state spends money within their region, and the southern state spends money within their region, et cetera. Okay, another element of the, of the, of the Constitution is the decision makers. And I'm going to focus a lot on um, just sort of straight centralization where there's a president who can spend money anywhere versus federalism where there's elected local politicians. But, you know, one thing that many countries in the world have to is they delegate a lot of authority to civil servants. And often those civil servants are not if above a certain level of seniority. Um, are not supposed to be posted to their home area. And, that, and they also get rotated a lot, and that's supposed to keep them neutral between, so they don't develop attachments to an area. So they're making decisions about when they don't have an attachment to either place. So we'll think about civil servants, you know, both politicians and civil servants. Obviously, there are lots of other de differences between politicians and civil servants. You know, we won't be trying to capture everything in this, this model. Then we'll also have budget and spending rules. If you're trying to constrain home bias, so if you think that maybe politicians are going to spend money in their home area, you could, you could try to constrain that by some sort of budget rule. Well, you have to have at least a certain level of, spread, of spreading spending around. And so many countries have rules like that. In the U.S., um, you know, there have been very certain state Supreme Courts have said there's too much disparity between funding for local school districts and state needs to equalize funding, for example. That would be another way to control uh, uh, biases. Okay, so those are, the constitutions can have rules about those things, but what can't a constitution do? Well, you know, as you start to be able to see maybe already, you know, the ideal thing would be to write a constitution saying you have to, spe you have to choose the best projects um, on technical grounds and you're not allowed to be corrupt. You know, we don't allow a constitution to do that. The constitution can't 
can't condition the, the allocation of funds based on site quality, and it can't, uh, and we'll assume that you know, the country has some distribution of gamma corruption costs, and it can't uh, influence that. Okay. okay. So in the paper, we go through a bunch of different possible constitutions, but let me focus on the most uh, important ones. Um, so the first one is decentralization. So there's a northern politician. They choose, they get allocated funds for one project. They have to choose among the two possible sites in the north, and the southern politician gets allocated for one project, chooses among the two possible sites in the south. There's also unconstrained centralization. There's a president, they have money for two projects, they can choose, they just, they have full, full freedom to choose where those are. They could choose two northern projects, two southern projects, one northern, one southern, whatever they think is best, or whatever they want. Okay, then you have this, I'm gonna start with those, because those are the simplest. Um, but then there are these other, other approaches, which can be thought of as ways to constrain centralization. So you get centralization without some of the possible um, effects of the home bias. So one would be a minimum spending clause. Uh, you could think of an equal spending clause. Turns out a minimum spending clause does, does slightly better in some situations, so let me focus on that. Um, uh, that you, know, you have a president, but they have to choose one project from the north and one from the south. Um, another one would be, or they have to spend at least, the minimum spending clause, they, they have to spend at least some money outside their home region. Uh, they could, um, and the other is the civil servant model. Okay. So what are, the, what are the results? Let me sort of tell you the first results and sort of sketch the, the argument for you and then go through some of the other results. The first result, remember alpha here is the degree of favoritism or is the value you put on the other area. So a high alpha means that you're you're not very favor you don't have a lot of favoritism towards your home area. A, a low alpha uh, means that you've got um, got a, a high home favoritism. So if you have low f home favoritism, the expected welfare for the population as a whole is higher under centralization than decentralization. So why is that? Well, one way to see this is if you've got Nehru in charge, then you know. He, Nehru's not going to be biased at all, so why not leave Nehru, why put any artificial restrictions on what Nehru's doing? Again, maybe I'm, I, I guess, yeah, I, maybe Nehru wasn't all he was cracked up to be, but you know, this uh, idealized Nehru. Um, uh, Nehru's going to choose the, the best project, uh, and if it so turns out that both of the, the two best projects are both from the home area, then they'll do that, but why restrict them from doing it? Because they're not biased. Okay, the, 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 but for high home favoritism, then expected welfare is higher under decentralization than centralization. Why is that? Well, let's say that people take the extreme case. You're completely uh, biased towards your home area. You put no weight on the welfare of the other area. Then you're definitely going to choose two projects from your home area. That means under centralization, you get two projects in the home area of the president, the best project and the second best project in that area. And in expectation, it'll be better to get the best project in the north and the best project in the south rather than the first best and the second best project in the, in the north. So, um, and so that's, um, you know, that's fairly straightforward. Turns out there's a, a, a very similar result for, uh, for, uh, for, for corruption. Um, that depending on the, the story I just told was one without corruption, but if you put corruption in there as well, uh, you, get, you get similar results. Okay, um, and if you look at the bottom of the slide, it, it sketches out the, you know, the, 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 the way the proof works. Okay. okay, so I think that that result is, is fairly, you know, it's fairly intuitive. I think what was a little bit more surprising and what I don't think we understood until we started writing down the model was that there are other strategies for, control, for addressing home favoritism they can be pretty effective if there's a high cost of corruption, but they may work much less well if corruption is low cost. So if there's a political culture that really, you know, if there's strong institutions, strong courts, if the political culture is such that people are shocked by corruption and vote corrupt politicians out of office, if the, if the politicians are somehow selected in a way that makes them, you know, uh, uh, very honest, then all of these, then, then 
other strategies for controlling home favoritism may work very well. And you may be able to have a centralized state with, that incorporates these other rules. But those aren't going to work very well if there's not much control over corruption. So let me, let me, um, let me try to be, um, let me try to, uh, to, I'll go through this in, uh, in, in the next couple of slides. But let me just take a look at Proposition 2 here, which is to some extent sort of the general statement. Imagine that you have, um, imagine that you have the no possibility of corruption. Then, if you, if you, um, if you force people to spend outside their home area, then they'll, you know, maybe they care a little bit about. They're from the north, but they care a little bit about the south. They'll choose the best project in the north and the best project in the south, and you'll do fine. But if there, if the, if corruption is relatively low cost. Then, if they're forced to spend money in a place they don't care about, they're much more tempted to just steal that money. They're less tempted to steal money from the place they do care about. They're more tempted to steal money from the place they don't care about. So you can see this in the civil service model. So if there's no corruption, then the civil service model is equivalent to unconstrained centralization. Right? The civil servant's not from either of the areas where they're working. They don't care about either, but they care about them equally. So they'll make, a f if they can't be corrupt, they'll make efficient allocation decisions between the two areas. But if they can be corrupt, you can wind up with a terrible outcome where, since they don't care about the areas where they're, where they're in charge of, they just steal the money. Okay. Um, okay. There's a similar result for the minimum spending clause. Um, um, so I'm, I think I'm just going to equal spending clauses also will work relatively well if, if, you, if corruption is not possible. But if corruption is possible, then, people, then they can work quite badly. Okay, let me skip over the details of this. There are a few other results that come out of the model. In some ways, these sound pretty obvious. Um, when home favoritism is present, then it actually makes sense to divide up the country into, um, into administrative regions that correspond to the identity regions. If people think of themselves as northerners and southerners, divide up the country that way rather than as east-west. And also, don't unnecessarily subdivide the north and the south. Now, there might be other, uh, you know, this is thinking, this paper was written about Kenya, and Kenya actually deliberately decided they were going to have subdivisions that were lower than the, uh, air, the primary identity units. I mean, there's many types of identity, as there is in every country. But, um, but they, did that, they did that for other political reasons. But this model would suggest there's a cost to doing that. Um, and that's just because you know, politicians can't, they, it restricts the degree of freedom, if you uh, some, um, to have to have these small areas. You can't allocate uh, appropriately across areas. OK. So, um, okay, so just to summarize the theory, um, first theory result is if you've got lots of home bias, decentralization does relatively well relative to, to, uh, to centralization. Second, if you've got some of the things, if you've got very strong control over corruption, you can go ahead, you can use centralization but add some features on to control the home bias. But if you've got, if you don't have strong control over corruption, then that may just lead people to, to spend the money uh, corruptly. And the proposition for that was that if you try to, if you try to, if, um, if there is home bias, I'll just go back to proposition two, if corruption's possible and home favoritism is present, then corruption's gonna be greater when you force people to spend outside their home area. So let me now talk about the, the empirics. So there was a, this is, Yes, you might characterize this as a lab in the field type experiment. It was done with uh, real politicians, but very, very local politicians. And they, they were eligible to receive a uh, public good, which is a dispenser for water treatment solution that would be placed at a communal water source. And they made actual incentivized choices between different packages. And the packages would vary both in who got to choose the location and who was responsible for restocking, restocking the water treatment solution? So one of the, in some of, sometimes politicians got to choose to get paid money, then this was not with government funds, this wasn't corruption at all, this was you know, a totally legitimate choice for them, um, where they could get paid uh, roughly six and a half dollars a month um, to, to restock the water solution. Now restocking the water solution should be fairly inexpensive to do. 
You just had to pick it up in the district capital and, you know, uh, and basically pour it into the, uh, the, the container. So they should have either been able to do this themselves or hire somebody to do it more cheaply. So there's an opportunity for some personal gain here. But I, I, don't, you know, I don't think we can call it corruption, but certainly personal gain. Um, alternatively, they could have the, the NGO do it, and, and, and uh, the NGO would get it done well. Okay. Um, so the wards um, uh, were entered into a lottery which gave out 50 dispensers. So that's why these, um, and if the counselor's ward was chosen to receive a dispenser, then they had a list of decisions, and one of their decisions was randomly implemented. So they should have had incentives, they had incentives to uh, say what they truly preferred on each question. So they also, they were also given sort of a separate uh, exercise. They were also saying, well, if, if, you're, if, you're tr location, if you win a dispenser, where do you want it to go? So let me first talk about where they wanted it to go. So we see there that the place, then they were given a booklet with description of all the characteristics of their, of their, uh, of their, er, of the, of the possible water points in their area. So these, um, so what we found is that they, as they should have, they waited, uh, this is really a pure public good, the more people who are using the water point, the more people benefit, um, and the costs are, you know, the, this could serve a, a water point independent of the number of users. So people valued water points with more users, as they should. They valued water points with dirty, that are likely to have dirtier water, as, as would make sense. So they seem to be considering welfare here. Now, they represent an area larger, an area that's not just their own village, but it's larger than that. And what we saw was that they also put weight on serving their own village. And by, we can back out from the relative weights they put on serving populated areas versus serving places in their own village. What's the relative weighting of, of, their villi of how they weight their village versus other villages? And the, what we get is an alpha, and you have to believe some structural assumptions here, so I wouldn't take this number too seriously, but you get an alpha of 0.248. That says that they roughly they value each person in their home area four times as much as people outside their home area. So very high uh, f home favoritism. Okay. And what's more, we got a very strong preference for deciding their own location. Okay. So I'll just, this is, I'm, you have to run these, this is, these are the regressions, but you have to um, um, run them through uh, some calculations to get the alpha equals 0.248. The other result that we got was that people, we did not actually see that strong preferences for controlling the money. Now, I think when we first started this paper, we thought, well, we're going to see, we're going to see how much people value location versus how much they value the money. And then when we got the result, we said, okay, it looks like they don't have that much of value on the money. Maybe these guys aren't as corrupt as we thought they were. We then sort of backed off from that a little bit because even though we knew and we tried to convey to them that they're not going to get in trouble if they cho make those choices, you know, we can't get inside their head. Maybe they thought that they were, they thought that, you know, they'd get in trouble for this. So I don't want to push that uh, uh, here. But what we found and what inspired some of the theory was this very strong result that in the situations in which they couldn't control the funds, they exhibited a much stronger preference for getting the money. So sorry, when they couldn't control where the money, where the, where the, the location of the dispenser, that's when they wanted the money. And that's a result that um, there are some things that are isomorphic, happy to discuss in, in Q&A. But that's a result that would not, that, that is very consistent with the proposition with Proposition 2, and I don't think necessarily flows out, a lot of, out of a lot of alternative models, except for ones that have pretty isomorphic implications. Um, so I think that that provides some empirical evidence for the you know, basic idea behind the theory, that if people, if people can't control the location, they're much more likely to be corrupt. Um, so let me just uh, you know, sort of sum up. So the theory suggests that when politicians um, strongly favor home areas, decentralization may be more attractive than centralization. And obviously, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of discussion in, 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 uh, in a, at the you know, sort of a, a newspaper level and, and uh, 
conversations among people level of in African politics of, of politicians having pretty strong home preferences, and our data is consistent with that. But there's actually a lot of countries in Africa are very, very centralized. Um, and then the second result is that constitutional alternatives to control home favoritism, which are also very prevalent, you know, many countries have civil service rules, for example, and, and officially delegate a lot of authority to civil servants, that those often perform pretty badly. They may perform well in a place where there's good control of corruption, but in places with bad control of con corruption, uh, they perform pretty badly. Our experiment suggests pretty strong home favoritism and, and find some evidence for this interaction with corruption, or I don't want to say corruption, but with opportunities for personal gain as well. So what are the implications of the model? Well, the, if we thought about this in a very general context, the implication is you should structure governance, and this could be in all sorts of settings, including you know, university governance or something else, so that the decision makers value those in their jurisdiction both highly so that they don't try and get personal gain and similarly so they're not biased between them. Um, but if we think about you know, this particular empirical results, this suggests that you know, our empirical results, uh, we hope this sheds some light on the Kenyan constitutional reforms which delegated authority to the county level, but the truth is that our empirical results are at the very, very micro level, very, very sort of hyper-local level. And what they suggest is that if, you, if politicians are spend allocating resources towards their own village, they're less likely to be, uh, to be they, they value that, the, um, they're less likely to seek opportunities for personal gain uh, in that context. So that would suggest that maybe we need to go even further and have programs that actually allocate pu local pu public good decisions really very, you know, very, very, at a very, very micro uh, level, very, very local level. Obviously, that's, you know, there are goods that are, that won't work for roads, that won't work for national defense, uh, but there may be a number of goods for which that does work. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks, Michael. So, we don't have a discussion, but we have a lot of time for questions, so please. Uh, wait for the microphone. Uh, so obviously one, you know, as you said earlier, one reason why they could be home favoritism is because these are politicians and they may care about their own voters. So this is less driven by intrinsic liking your own type of people, but more about voters. And so the one theory could be that uh, larger villages in the area are more likely to you know, elect people from larger villages are more likely to be elected councillors and therefore these councillors are favouring their own areas not because they're their own areas but because they have the largest number of voters. Is there any way you can distinguish between favouritism out of intrinsic preferences and favouritism out of the motivation to get re-elected? Uh, let me just repeat the question to make sure I understood it right. There was a little sound quality problem. So, um, this was distinguishing between preferences and an incentive-based electoral incentives. Is yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Great, no, great question. So, um, so let, me, let me mention one, one thing that I think we can exclude. Um, there, so in this setting, the politicians tend to have their sort of core supporters or the people from their, their very local area, say from their village, and then the, the swing voters are the people from further away. So in the simplest, uh, the simplest explanation, the simplest sort of electoral incentives uh, argument, and certainly you can have more sophisticated ones, would say that they actually have electoral incentives to, to put this outside their home village, obviously within their constituency, but outside their home village. So I think it's not, it's, these results aren't really consistent with that, that simplest story. Now you could tell, you could tell more sophisticated stories um, that I think would, that would be not in terms of preferences, but incentives, they would wind up looking pretty isomorphic to this in terms of the policy implications. I'm happy to come back to that if people are interested. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I wanted to ask, uh, both in theory and in your experiment, so do you allow the gamma and alpha to be correlated? So one thing I think you might think is that when you're, when you're closer to home, when you're working at home, it's easier to engage in corrupt activities. Um, and in fact, I think that's why they, I think it's part of why people move civil servants so often is also to, to avoid these repeated interactions in which corruption can be built. 
Um, I guess it wasn't quite allowed in your experiments. So I wasn't sure how you think that fits into the experimental work, uh, but also in, in terms of your model. I was curious how you're modeling that. Yeah. Um, so I think in the so so in reality, one can can imagine all sorts of reasons why these might be positively correlated, negatively correlated, et cetera. Um, in our particular setting, I think that remember what they had to do was to deliver the, if they, let's say they chose the opportunity where they were going to get the financial benefit. Then what they had to do is they had to deliver the chlorine, uh, the chlorine solution to the water point. That's actually a more costly thing to do if it's further away from their home village than if it's in their home village. So actually in this, in the particular setup, if things should have gone the other way actually rather than this way, which is another reason why I think it sort of tends to support this type of uh, story in this particular context. But obviously, as a general matter, this, those correlations could, could work various ways. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm from South Africa. Uh, so we have local authorities that very often uh, encompass two or three towns. And a mayor would come from one town, and then the funding would not go to projects in the other towns. So then you would often, after a year or two, have some local protests, and that leads to the mayor being pushed out. So is there a way in your model to, to, to include local pushback as a cost um, that could uh, you know, serve as a disincentive to, 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 to send funds to your own town and not to another town? Um, so, so you know, we've this particular model has. You know, if I think strictly in terms of the model, uh, the, there's no commitment. So the politician just, you know, the politician just does whatever they want uh, once they're in office. So obviously, the real world is much more complicated than that, and there are are electoral incentives. Um, so I think, you know, we've the results here are very, very stark in this uh, this extreme in this extreme setting. But I think. I still think, although they're much starker in this model than they would be in reality, I think there's still something to, uh, something to this because often you know, a politician will put together a political coalition and they need to, they, if, there's three, if they represent three towns, you know, they may need 1.6 of those towns backing them, but they don't need uh, all three of them and they may put all the resources in those 1.6. Um, I might have missed this in the first two minutes, in which case apologies, but um, uh, you're, you didn't talk about two of the sort of features that are often involved in, de in models of decentralization, so kind of information about place um, yeah. and then also implementation and that this was kind of a, like implementation right. is trivial for these types of projects. Right. Um, and I was just wondering if you could sort of speculate or discuss a bit about how these conclusions might change if you start thinking about those things. Yeah. So I don't think we have, you know, unfortunately the experiment, you know, the model was written based on the results from the experiment. So I don't think we have an airtight way of saying, you know, it's this model versus Bardon's, you know, Bardon type model. But let me, let me say why, you know, I think it is, uh, why I think information is not really critical here. Um, one of, so all of the counselors got this booklet that listed a bunch of features of all of the water points in their area. And so I think that meant that the, you know, I can't totally exclude the possibility. The reason why it's not airtight is, you know, maybe they knew that, yes, there are these two, two, I, there are these two places in my, uh, in my area. Maybe, you know, maybe they had better information. They, they knew how many users from the booklet that each place had or how many reported users. And they knew something about what type of water it was, whether it was from a stream or a well or something like that. But they said, well, I know that this, you know, there's been a cholera death in my, in my village at this particular well, and so it's really important to put it there. So we can't totally disprove that. But I think that, um, I, I guess I'm somewhat, these are not, they're not representing large areas at all. I think if there had been a cholera death anywhere in their area, for example, they would have, uh, they would have known something about it, especially together with the, 
with the, the booklet. And in terms of the implementation costs and difficulty and ease of supervision, I think that, as I mentioned earlier, that's actually easier if it's in the home area. So the fact that they were more likely to say, I'll do the implementation myself and get paid for it when it was in another area is suggests that that wasn't what was driving the results. Oh, oh. Oh, 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 yeah. So look, this is a pro decentralization paper, uh, fundamentally. And, um, well, to be more precise, it's saying in areas where there's lots of home bias and where there's weak control of, of corruption, it's a pro decentralization paper. It's, a, it's yeah. Um, so I would say to the extent that you believe that local people also have better information, then, then it's, that's just you know, pushes in the same direction. I'm saying even if you shut off this information channel, uh, there's, there's a whole separate case for decentralization that's nothing to do with information and is about preferences. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah. Uh, maybe. Um, great presentation. I have a question on selection of those who make the decisions of where to place the, the dispensers in that case. Whether it might be that uh, the village they come from also happens to have some other advantages um, which help them being elected into whatever position they're in and which now makes that village more suitable to place these dispensers. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So I don't think we can we can totally uh, rule that out. Uh, let me. There's two. There's, you can interpret that question empirically. Like, could that be driving the results that um, the place that most need the water, public infrastructure, elects the person, and then they, you know, do it there? Um, I I can't rule that out. I don't think that's probably what was going on. And then the other aspect of this is just in terms of policy. Um, you know, the politically organized areas might get all the rents. And I guess, to me, that's an, one more reason. That's actually a reason to decentralize and maybe to decentralize down to very local levels uh, so that things, resources get allocated based on you know, population or something like that uh, down to very local areas and then can be allocated you know, within that. All right, maybe one more question, a quick one. No, I haven't seen it. So would it be fair to say this is a very pro-libertarian paper? Because, um, I mean, if you take the things down at the village level, within village there are hamlets, and then you can say that you will favor your own hamlet, and then ultimately you come down to your own individual level. So, you know, then how, how, do you, how do you deal with, for example, the benefits of doing things in aggregation? So doing things? So um, I, I'm not sure if I can articulate this correctly, but there are costs of being libertarian. You know, there are costs of, there are, uh, the, the best case model is you give, you know, nobody pays any taxes, nobody gets any public services, and oh. things stay at the individual level. I mean, I guess what I would say is, I guess I'm in Europe, sort of. Um, uh, you know, I guess subsidiarity is the, is the right principle. So if you've got a public good that operates at the level of, um, at, at the, like a school or a water point, then you would make the decision at the level that, you know, at, at that level, if you've got things like, so I don't think you could go down all the way to the individual level for water points because it's actually a pure, at the local level, it's a pure public good. There's zero marginal cost to another person using it or close to zero marginal cost, not, not truly zero. Um, um, if you're talking about the public good being, um, rural roads, you can't decentralize that to the village level. You've got to decentralize that to the uh, district level or county level in Kenya. If the good is national highways, then it has to be made at a national level. Um, so yeah, this would be, yeah, if you combine this with some other theory, you'd get something like subsidiarity out of this. All right, uh, thank you. I think we have to yep. go to the next presentation. That's my turn. <laughs>
So, thanks a lot for the presentation. So, my, my work is actually quite, quite close to that work, also uh, much more empirical. So, my presentation is on local elections, state capture, and development in Nigeria. And the subtitle is Mana from Heaven uh, Devilish. So, I, I've been uh, working on that quite, quite some time, but I'm very welcome or very happy about, about inputs. And the motivation on that paper is kind of coming from the natural resource uh, curse literature. Uh, natural resources have been found to negatively affect economic development, especially in, in weak institutional environments. And also that windfalls of resources can deteriorate the, the quality of, of democratic institutions and also the, the selection of politicians. On the other side, there is a large literature on, on decentralization of government and, and how uh, decentralized uh, institutions can, can kind of improve accountability and, and responsiveness uh, of, of voters' needs. So my paper is kind of looking uh, at the case of Nigeria with regard to, to, these, uh, to these literatures. So uh, Salai Martin and Supramanian, who, who uh, had a, a, an important paper on, on the resource curse, uh, analyzing specifically the case of Nigeria, said the main problem affecting the Nigerian economy is the fact that the oil revenues that the government gets are regarded as mana from heaven, which tends to corrupt institutions and lower the long-term growth prospects. So this is exactly kind of the the motivation also for my paper, although their, their analysis was more like kind of a long-term growth study at, at the national level, and they also use kind of cross-country data to, to kind of have explanations, whereas, whereas my, my work goes much more into the, to the local level, because I think that the local government level is important, we need to understand it, and especially for African countries, there is still little knowledge on, on uh, how, how local communities are, are, are governed. So in this paper, I analyzed the political resource curse at the local government level and, and how it affects local economic development. I specifically ask two questions. The first is how do the changes in, in global oil prices affect local democratic institutions. So this is kind of the part where I look how, uh, how the resource revenues affect local democratic institutions. And, and then the, the second step is to look at how the democratic institutions affect development at the local level. So my line of argument is that the, the oil price which is globally determined, so uh, Nigeria is kind of, uh, even though they have uh, large uh, oil productions, they're they are a price taker globally. So the oil price uh, heavily in fact, uh, affects the tax revenue allocation. So the, most of tax revenue in, in Nigeria is collected from uh, tax on oil production. It's about uh, 75%. And these tax revenue allocations are then distributed across the country. They are distributed to the state and local governments. So um, the state and local governments, every month, they kind of just get you know, their share of, 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 the, of, the, of the pie of the oil revenues. Um, and they can then uh, use it for, for public goods provision uh, and, and, their, and their development or as well, of course, uh, there is lots of anecdotal evidence that large sums of, of that money are actually diverted to, to private pockets. I argue then that the more money is flowing into the state and local governments, the larger are the incentives for the state governors, so the kind of middle uh, level uh, administrative units to, to capture the state. So the state governors, they have a lot of influence over, over policies and also over the local governments. And um, I argue that the more money is flowing in, the more 
it's in their interest to, to control the local government, so it's, it's quite intuitive. This means that also the local elections are, are, um, are kind of endangered of, um, of, of being captured by the state government, government. So it happened that in many cases, I will, I will show a bit more, more data on that, it happened that a lot of local elections were actually just cancelled or, or delayed uh, by, the, by the state governors. So my argument is that um, in order to have, for them to have more control over, over, the, over the funds, it's in their interest to appoint like local governments instead of having elections. Because the appointed governments are, are just uh, accountable to them, to the state governments, but not, not to the people really. And then the, the final step is that uh, I, I kind of compared uh, elected local governments to, to appointed governments and say, okay, because uh, elected governments are, are accountable to the people, they uh, are better for, for local development. So that's the, the chain of argument. Why, why does it matter? The, it matters because in, in many developing countries we have a lot of natural resources, yet uh, poor democratic institutions. So it's really important to know how, in a weak institutional environment, how, how societies deal with, with resource wealth. And decentralization has been promoted as a, a solution to growth problems, yet it's, it, there is actually little knowledge uh, about it. So um, as, as Basley and, and Burgess say, it's understanding what makes government responsive to citizens' needs is a key issue in political economy. It is particularly uh, poignant in, in low-income countries where, in the absence of market opportunities, vulnerable populations rely in large measure on state actions for their survival. So this is exactly also kind of uh, the case in Nigeria where um, people rely, for example, on, uh, with regard to education and healthcare, they rely on, on the local governments. And if they don't perform, they are kind of... Uh, uh, exposed to, to mismanagement. So just quickly to preview the results. So I kind of find that um, tax revenue allocations to state and local governments are driven by global oil prices. This is, this is pretty clear uh, association. And then um, higher tax revenue allocations like resource windfall are associated with fewer elect local government councils. And then finally, um, the elected local governments are, are better able to use these resources actually to turn them into to, to development and, 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 uh, and public goods provision. Um, so I contribute to the, the following literatures, first of all on the, on the political resource curse. Um, so I kind of present a different mechanism how resource revenues can affect uh, institutions and, 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 and development really through the, through the local governments. And then there is recently has been a large literature on subnational governance in resource-rich economies, um, but most studies focus more on, on South American countries or, or Asian countries, so there is um, there's still little knowledge in this regard uh, for African countries. And then there is a large literature on decentralization and accountability. And finally, also a literature on elected versus appointed officials. So how is the Nigerian fiscal federalism uh, structured? So I already said that the revenues uh, from taxes comes from oil production and, and VAT, and they're collected centrally uh, in the federation account and then distributed to the three tiers of government, the, the federal government, the state government, and the local government. So the federal government gets almost half of the, of the share, the, the state government's about 26%, and the local government's uh, about 20%. And the oil revenues are really important in, in terms of tax revenues for, for Nigeria. So they are about 70% of, of all revenues. And uh, I have to add that, for example, the local governments, they almost uh, raise no tax revenue on their own. Um, yeah, I, I go around. So the, the revenue is, is uh, distributed according to a, a formula. 
which includes like population, internal revenue generation efforts, uh, land mass. So there's different indicators for each uh, state and local governments. And once the formula is determined, it kind of stays constant over, over time. So based on, on this formula, each uh, local government gets their share every month. And, and, and I have like data on, on, on monthly allocations uh, from 1999 to 2014. So this is kind of a, a graphical illustration uh, for, the, for the index weight. So each local government is kind of uh, uh, assigned a, an index weight and this really determines how much, how much to get. And as I, I don't show it here, but the analysis shows that it's mainly driven by, by population. So the, it's just once uh, the census, uh, population census is updated, then uh, the, the kind of the formula is, is, is as well uh, updated. But otherwise it's, it's constant over time. Here we see uh, a graph of the oil prices in, in red over time. So this is kind of my study period. So it's from 1999 to 2000. Uh, 14, and we see that uh, the total revenue allocations really uh, correlate with with the the oil price. I will also show that uh, more uh, numerically. So the the local government council, what what is their role? Um, so they they are quite important for for policy, especially in in uh, in education and health but also they are, are uh, responsible for uh, economic development uh, together with the, with the state governments. So why, um, so the state government, as I already uh, announced, they, you know, in many cases, they started, instead of having elections, they started appointing their, their local, local governments. And uh, here we see a, a graphical il illustration of that. So, in 1999, all local governments were, were elected uh, as, a, as a preparation for the first uh, presidential elections. And then in 2002, because um, the voter register was not updated, uh, they couldn't have uh, local elections. So suddenly, the um, number of uh, uh, locally elected governments dropped. So this was more a kind of uh, a legal reason why they were not elected. Uh, and then there was, once the, the, the voter register was updated, uh, they had local elections again. But over time, more and more um, state governors, they kind of canceled the local elections. So you see there is a kind of a variation in, in, in elected local governments. Um, and at the, at the end of the period, only like 50% of, of local governments were, were actually elected and the others were, were just appointed. Here you see kind of a geographic distribution. So this is the share of the, all the month between 1999 and 2013 of having uh, an elected local government. So you see there is in some parts, uh, in some states, you had very few local elections. And, and in others, the more the greener areas, the, they had quite some positive practice of, of, uh, of local elections. I have to say that, you know, if, if you ask Nigerian people, they would say, um, actually, you know, the local elections, they are uh, really of poor quality. So usually it's one party that just wins all the, on, all the council seats. But still, if you, if you look at, uh, at the processes, the, 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 the democratic practice really differs across places. So in some places you have like, Primary, uh, primary elections, etc., and in other places, uh, the state governor is really like more like an autocrat and just ruling by himself and appointing his people, etc. So there's there's large variation in, in that. I also have to say how I, I I got the data. So I used newspaper articles to collect the data because it's not public. So nobody really in Nigeria, apart from you know their own local government, knows really whether they are in. Where they, where they had actually elected local governments and where they were uh, appointed. So I, I kind of scanned through thousands of newspaper articles to, to uh, uh, figure out 
when there were elections, how long uh, councillors were, were in office, etc. So um, I start with a very kind of basic uh, OLS specification where I just assume that uh, the elected local councils are kind of uh, exogenously determined and we have these periods of, of uh, elected councils and periods of, of appointed councils. Uh, and then I'm interested in, um, in the interaction together with the revenue allocations to, to determine a, kind of a proxy for local development for which I use uh, uh, the satellite light data because that's kind of the only um, comprehensive data that was really available at the, at the local level. So I'm, I'm really interested in, in that coefficient and then of course I also uh, include elected council and, and revenue allocations separately. Uh, I have to say maybe the index, um, so you see here I, I, I have the index T plus one and here T, so the idea is that having an elected local government in this year affects growth from this year to the next year. So that's kind of the idea. Because the policies enacted by the local government need some time to be, to be uh, implemented. And then I include uh, um, a, a local government fixed effect um, and a governor fixed effect because the, go the governor has quite some influence over policies as well uh, and, uh, and the time fixed effect. And the elected council variable is measured as from zero to 12 over a year, I have, I have monthly data, but because of the light data, I need to aggregate to the year. So uh, it's zero to 12 uh, month, essentially, whether how long the, the, the local government was elected. So uh, the first uh, results, they, they show that um, the interaction of uh, having an elected local government and, and the allocations, the, the log change, that they have actually uh, a significant, highly significant effect on, on light growth. Um, so uh, this, is, this result is quite clear and that here I also use like different lags. So um, the results get almost uh, a bit stronger if, if I add some, some of, the, of the lags. And also just the, the elected council variable has some, uh, some, some positive uh, uh, effect. And here you see I I control for, for these different fixed effects, but the, the results are, are quite uh, stable. Um, then also, you could argue that uh, the revenue allocations, um, they are kind of um, endogenous. Uh, so I use kind of an instrument to, to instruments for log revenue allocations. But in fact, actually, the results are, 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 are very similar. So it seems that the formula is really followed closely. Um, so the, the instrumentation of the log revenue allocation doesn't really make a, a difference. Um, but quickly, I show the results here. Uh, as a depend variable, I, I look at the local elected government. And you see there is quite a, a negative correlation with the oil price. And if I look at revenue allocations, there is there is really a strong negative uh, correlation, meaning the more money is flowing into these local governments, the, the shorter or the, the less often the, the local elected governor is, is, or the local government is, is elected. Um, then it's really the concern that, okay, the elected council uh, is, is, is also in, endogenous because, you know, like better development could lead to uh, different decisions of, of the governor to appoint uh, councillors or or to actually uh, have elections. So I'm so this is this is kind of very uh, happy if you have, have uh, kind of comments on that. So I as an instrument I use the pre-colonial institutions um, times the log oil price. So the idea is that uh, the, the exclusion restriction is that. Uh, the pre-colonial institutions like sophistication of, of local, local political institutions uh, can affect having an elected local council um, kind of only or yeah can affect uh, development only through 
through kind of uh, the elected council. So um, the, the interaction with the local oil price, so this is kind of capturing the, the allocations to the local government, and, and this affects development only through having elected council. Um, but I'm still, I'm still kind of working on, on, on that um, to, to improve uh, this identification, but I, so far I couldn't come up with a, with a, with a different uh, instrument. And then on the second stage I, will, I use the, the, the fitted values to, to explain the change in, in log life. Um, so the, here you see a map of, of the pre-colonial and political institutions. So you see in, in some parts, the, this measures kind of the sophistication of, of, of the political institutions uh, prior to, to the colonial regimes. And you see in some areas you really have, you had like uh, high sophistication, like three levels of, of government within these areas. And in other, in other areas, you had just had kind of village, village council. So I use this these institutions as, as, um, um, yeah, as, as an instrument. Uh, this is, this is the, the first stage, so we see kind of high, high uh, correlations, um, but I wanna, yeah, I wanna go on to the, so this is kind of the two, two stage least squares uh, results, and uh, here, I find still uh, like a uh, very uh, positive effect, but only of the, of the elected council. And the interaction is, is uh, still positive, but not significant uh, anymore. But the effect uh, on, on light growth is, is quite uh, substantial. And then also try to figure out what you know, could lead to more capture of, of, uh, of local governments by the, by the state governor. And um, I, I tried to find reasons in, in, the, in the party structure, so whether senators are of the same party as the state governor, so they would kind of have uh, covered, or they would be kind of protected by, by the central government, um, or whether it's a governor's first term, so he has some, some re-election concerns, etc. cetera. Uh, but this is also still, still quite uh, preliminary. Uh, I do some, some analysis of, of the different, different factors, but this is, is so far more kind of a, a thought experiment, but it's not, it's not yet uh, really uh, definite. So to, to wrap up, um, so I find substantial evidence of, of a local political resource curse through this line of argument that I, I presented in the beginning. Um, the conduct of local elections is likely to be negatively affected by the resource revenues due to capture of, of the state governments because the state governor has an interest to appoint his own people to these offices in order to have better control over, over the resources. And then on the other side, having an elected local government seems to be more conducive to, to local economic growth and the resource windfalls seems to uh, have, have a more positive effect on development once, once the local government uh, is, is elected. Yeah, that's, that's it. Thanks so much for your attention. So I think this is a, a very nice paper. Um, just to briefly summarize it, um, I think it was you know, very clear, but um, the causal chain in the paper is that when there's an oil price increase, that causes the central government to be allocating more funds to these local regions. And the idea is that that creates greater incentives for the state governor to seize control of those funds by not having an election for the local council but rather just appointing uh, people. And then that in turn causes worse outcomes. So uh, I think the, the 
you know, as far as my assessment of the paper, I think first, I think it's an important question. I think it's an important question, not just for Nigeria, um, but actually much more broadly, because I think what's striking about Nigeria is it is a place with these multiple levels of government that are elected, and that's something that is not present in a lot of countries, but could be. And if we think about why, you know, there's a general view that the state is not doing very, doing very well and not functioning very well in much of Africa, and, you know, one possibility is that if there were local elected government, maybe it would do better, maybe not. I mean, people in, certainly, despite my, uh, my uh, lot in uh, local government in Kenya, people in Kenya are not thrilled with, uh, with the, you know, county governments, for example. But anyway, um, I, I, the point I was addressing is I think it's raising a very important set of questions. I think another nice thing about the paper is that it, it's really, you know, there's a lot of integration of different types of data sources here, data sources that involved, you know, serious, I assume involved quite serious work. So uh, the, the media analysis you heard about, you know, I think the nightlights analysis also took work in mapping that into the, mapping them in, into each other. Um, I think another nice thing about this is that, you know, it, it first goes through the OLS identification uh, or it shows the OLS relationships there, and then goes through the instrumentation strategies. And you know, I've, there are definitely some things to quibble about on the on the on the on the instruments. And you know, you can always ask questions about exclusion restrictions and so on. But it, I thought it was it was you know thoughtful. Um, okay. Um, so I think in terms of you know, this is not. Maybe one thing I would, you know, this paper obviously relates to a lot of issues, relates to the resource curse. Um, I think I, I know, maybe it's my own, you know, biases since uh, working, as you saw from the previous uh, presentation, but I think I would, I, I think the policy conclusion is in some ways to have stronger rules guaranteeing independence of local government and ensuring local elections. And, you know, maybe that aspect of it could be played up a little bit. Uh, more relative to some of the resource course, course implications. Um, okay, so um, so I think those are all, uh, you know, uh, in general I like the paper a lot. Here are some areas where I had some, you know, um, empirical concerns or, or other questions. So if you remember that one was about spatial correlation. So if you remember there were some pretty broad areas of solid colors in some of those pictures of Nigeria that were put up. So if you do the standard, let's take the extreme, and let's say that the spatial correlation was really high, then even though you might think that you've got a lot of separate observations, maybe you actually have fewer you know, truly independent observations. Maybe, maybe what you're seeing is just you know, this whole region of the country. Remember, this is, so there's, time, there's fixed time effects in there. There's, there's other fixed effects in there. So it wouldn't just be you know, it wouldn't just be, oh, things were bad in the period when oil prices were high. It wouldn't just be things were bad in this area of the country consistently. But, you know, you could have some trend that hit a particular region of the country at a particular time, and then if you had spatial, you know, enough spatial correlation, you might, the power might not be as big as, uh, as, it, as it looks. Um, another thing that I wondered about is state by time fixed effects. So I'm not sure if that's doable, but if the traditional political institutions vary at a sort of sub-state level, then you, know, you might be able to do more with that, which would also help address that, you know, that concern. One concern about night lights. So I think night lights are you know, very clever and, and deserve to be used a lot, but I think any time you use them, even though they're highly correlated with income, you do have to ask, there might be things that drive night lights some of the coefficients here were really big, particularly the coefficients on the interactions. Uh, you really got very strong effects of local government control and periods of, of high oil prices. So then you, one thing to worry about, and I just don't know enough about Nigeria, is is there something that might sort of artificially affect this? And, you know, um, the town that I work on in, uh, in Kenya, where I work the most in Kenya, you know, they've just been, the local government's actually just been installing streetlights. That's some, you know, they don't do a lot. Kenya's local governments are not, you know, super strong, but one of the things they were doing is putting in streetlights. So that did make me worry, like, if that was, a, 
And I know Rwanda, I was just in Rwanda, and there the government has some rule that every house has to have a light on outside its window to sort of, as a public good, to sort of illuminate the area at night and reduce crime or, or, or whatever. And so if there was some policy, you know, if this was something a lot of local governments were doing, then maybe you're picking up something, you know, spurious. Uh, that it, um, and I guess I'd be, um, yeah, I guess a, a related observation is that it would be nice to show the intermediate outcomes. Um, you know, if you were able to, you, you did look at the health things, um, but there wasn't as much going on there as elsewhere. So what are the channels that are driving this improvement in economic activity? If you could add, you've got a lot of steps of your story with evidence along the chain, so I don't want to ask for the impossible, but I guess it's easy for a discussant to just throw out more things. So if you were able to say, yes, I can show some more channels, you know, that would be nice. Um, and, um, okay. Uh, one other comment was over-identification. I don't know if there are other factors that influence whether there's an elected or appointed government. Um, you know, some factors related to predetermined local political culture. Um, um, you know, I think of sometimes when what allows higher levels of government to take over from local levels of government is if there's, you know, violence or, or uh, corruption or other scandals, and maybe there are some things that you could use to... Um, to influence whether that, you know, whether that happened. Obviously, you know, that's a problem with the OLS, but that's exactly why you instrument. So, uh, but maybe there's something that you could use that would provide identification. I, yeah, um, um, another form of, another source of variation that could be used for identification. Um, okay. Um, so, here's something that I think the paper already does to some extent, but there might be a story that Yes, revenues in a particular town fall if there's an appointed government, but that might not be an overall loss to society because maybe the regions, the funds just go to another region, um, or maybe they, the benefits just get delayed. And the, you know, you could imagine, and don't believe this, but you could imagine a story where the government, the higher level of government's like, well, as long as you've got this sort of appointed caretaker administration, we're not going to release the funds. We're going to release them later when the local, when the elected government's in charge so they can spend them in accordance with the population wishes. I mean, if there's a way you could rule some of that out, that would help. Obviously, you do have some interactions, so just in funds, whatever funds there are, are spent more effectively when there's a, so that does, does help. Um, I don't know if there's a way to, sort of, this is really broadening things out, but um, I, you know, this is suggesting that the resource curse is sort of worse under authoritarian situations than under democracy. And I don't know whether there's evidence for that. I know some recent papers on the resource curse are in Brazil where during a period where I think there was, you know, locally elected governments, so that didn't eliminate the resource curse. Um, but is there, you know, is there general, I just don't know this literature on the resource curse well enough. Is it worse under uh, autocracy or under democracy or is there no difference? Uh, or does it go the other way? Um, and then another question on the theory was um, uh, how much of the problem is volatility, not theory, but you know, sort of broader, you know, broader beyond just this paper. How much of the problem is volatility of natural resource revenue versus the extent of the revenue? Um, so one of the models that was mentioned in the paper emphasizes the temptation to steal today is higher if there's a, if, you know, you might want to not steal and keep collecting those rents indefinitely and get reelected, or you might say, well, if the resources are really high today, I'll steal today because the, the continuation value is lower. So that would suggest the volatility is very important. I don't know whether it's possible to look at you know, different natural resources that are more or less have volatile pricing and, and differentiate these things. Um, um, okay. Um, and then a final empirical comment. Um, you know, a lot, in the, there was a lot on lag structure in the paper, and I think that makes sense. You wouldn't expect expenditures to turn into greater economic activity just, you know, the same day. Um, on the other hand, I've worried a little bit about the degrees of freedom by sort of estimating different lags, you know, uh, separately. So maybe there's a way to think about model selection or correcting the standard errors for that. But I'm not overly concerned about that. Just, you know, on the long list of things that one could potentially do, I throw that on. So, and, and overall, I thought this was a really uh, thought-provoking and, and very interesting paper. Thank you. Thanks so much.
Uh, maybe I can address uh, a few of the points. Uh, of course, there's a lot of uh, criticism on the, on the light data, right? And uh, I cannot really uh, escape that. I kind of exclude the regions which, which have oil production. So there's lots of discussion about blurring and stuff like that. So uh, I kind of exclude that, that area in order to, to take out these, uh, these mismeasurements or, yeah. Um, and then, of course, I, what I intend to do is, is using public goods provision as, a, as an alternative uh, outcome measure, right? That would be much more uh, convincing if, if I can show that actually, you know, education and, and healthcare services suffer during times of, of appointed, appointed governments. Um, and then the, the spatial correlation, uh, that's a kind of a big concern. So uh, what I see is that the kind of state by time fixed effects, they, they absorb most of, of, of the variation. Um, so I, the, the, the question is whether really the remaining, the remaining variation then still, still kind of shows, shows the effect. And also uh, clustering, of course, at, at the state level uh, is, is possible, but since uh, there's not so many states, that could be a, a concern too. Uh, yeah, um, on the mechanism, yeah, I think there is there's still kind of, uh, I could still kind of more try to figure out what really defines capture of, of state governments. It, in Nigeria, it's always a problem of, you know, having not enough data at, at that level. So any kind of data is hard to get, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll rather have some more questions. Yeah. Uh, thanks, it was a great paper. It's not so much a question as a, as something, so we had a, there was a, visiting student from Navarre was in Oxford for, for a few months and he's, he was studying kind of the same question as you in a sense of like kind of using variation in oil prices globally to look at kind of revenue locally in terms of fiscal transfers but he was looking at the effect on conflict mm -hmm. and I think it would be interesting to see how kind of his result kind of matched to yours because I think if I remember correctly his result was basically like the increase in um, in revenues increased the incentives for conflict because people wanted to actually get into the government and get those rents. Mm. And so that kind of, I think that would also have the negative effects you see in terms of kind of night lights and growth, but through a different channels. So it would be interesting to see if you can kind of try to address those two things at the same time. Because I think the data he's using was kind of publicly available like lead data. So you might be able to do some of that too. Yeah, in fact, I have a second paper on conflict. So it's exactly the same, but we look at how the resource revenues affect violence at the local level which I will present at 4.30. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but definitely it's also the question whether violence then also affects whether a local government is elected or not. That's true. Um, so thanks, yeah, really interesting paper. So I wanted to just know a little bit of the breakdown of the overall effect that you saw on, I think your outcome measure was either the number of elections or binary whether there were. Uh, elections, and I just wanted to know, is that coming from the government officials actually canceling elections, is it coming from people retiring, not being able to field new candidates and entrants? I just wanted to sort of hear about the, the breakdown of where that effect was coming from. Yeah, I think, you know, in the beginning, kind of the, because the Constitution says that local governments have to be elected, right? Uh, in the beginning, it was it was followed very well, but then there was this problem with the with the voter register, and from that point on, as as state governors realized that okay, local governments don't need necessarily to be elected, right? They started to kind of uh, experimenting with that, and then you see all kind of different patterns. Um, I mean, there is there is probably cases where you know local governors kind of died and then there was a question, would you have another local elections or not? Um, and then there were also lots of legal battles. Um, it's, it's kind of, you know, these measures seems to be very crude. On the other side, it's, it's like uh, very difficult to get more information on, on what, what was actually happening on the ground, but kind of my my impression when I, when I did kind of these media analyses was that there is really lots of variation and also political competition uh, 
varies a lot across across the places. Um, you know, really, in some places you had like primary elections, and then you had different parties competing for the local governments, and then uh, one party won, the other was you know contesting the result in a in a election tribunal, etc. So really, you know, like kind of strong strong uh, signals of, 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 of democracy. And in other places, the, the governor was just, you know, n not bothering about organizing the, the election at all. So you have, you have great variation. Unfortunately, uh, it's, it's really hard to, to capture it in, in, in the data. Any other questions? No? Okay, then uh, thanks so much for your attention and have a good afternoon. <laughs>